So on these Wednesday nights, we usually start with a, about a half hour meditation. So we'll do that. I'll, I'll offer some guidance for that. And then we'll move into the talk, talking part of the evening. So just take a minute to find yourself a comfortable position to rest the body. And it's okay to really take a minute to explore what feels comfortable enough to sit. It's a way of being kind. Just to not, not to just assume that the body is fine, but to just check. Maybe another blanket would be useful or another cushion under the knees. And just a slight adjustment to the distribution of weight. And once you've taken your time with this, then we can just really accept the posture that we've chosen. And so here in this posture that we've chosen, we can just take a couple of deep breaths. And here in this simple movement of air deeply in and out of the lungs, we can feel some ancestor wisdom because it's this deep breathing that's such a simple way to support a regulated nervous system. I'm not demanding anything of this nervous system, of this body, of this heart. We're just remembering that sometimes there are little strategies that support a little more ease. We're taking our time with the posture. We're taking a, a couple of seconds for a couple of deep breaths. In these little ways, we're just inviting ease into the system. Sometimes we can make too much out of meditation. Like there's some destination that we're aiming for.
but we can take up or try on a different attitude. An attitude of acceptance. Remembering that we don't have to be better. We don't have to accomplish anything, be goal directed. It's actually right here in the middle of an easeful existence, a restful existence that we begin to feel, feel deeply into our own experience. We can more deeply connect with the body. You might notice where we're holding some tension. We might feel the residue of our day. Maybe there's some energy that is lingering from the doing of our day. Perhaps some restlessness or a lot of thinking. Or maybe we're even pleasantly surprised at how accessible it is to feel comfort or ease or relaxation. So meditation isn't about getting somewhere, but actually feeling more deeply. Connecting with how it really is for us. And this might involve knowing that we have some worries or fears. You might be feeling into the habits of our personalities. This is all part of connecting. And so with an attitude of acceptance, we receive all that we can learn all that we can know by listening. We start to see that whatever it is we're feeling or noticing or connecting with, it actually doesn't have to, we don't actually have to own it. You can just know it, feel it, 
Let it move. Feel it, know it, and let it move. You don't have to own it. Our bodies, our personalities, our joys, our wounds. Everything can be felt, known, everything moves. And we'll continue in silence for a while longer now.
and opening your eyes when you're ready. You take a minute to stretch, grab some water, whatever you need to do. It's okay to even step away from your computer for a couple of minutes. Well, it's good to see you here, feel your presence. <clears throat> I just like to take a minute to look, just look at you. <laughs> you might want to do that too. Just appreciate being in community, even in this virtual way. I'm wondering if anybody's here for the first time, if you are, if you'd like to unmute yourself and say hello, no pressure. You can say your name, what pronouns you use and where you're zooming in from if you'd like. Well, that's great. I was, that's a great segue. I was gonna, at the end of this little um, hello session, I was gonna see if any of my friends from Be Queer Now are here. If you are, raise your hand. Oh, yay, cool, welcome. <laughs> Be Queer Now is um, one of Common Ground's many community groups. Um, and it's a regular Wednesday night sitting group for people in the queer community. And Scotty Hall and Brian Young lead that group. I don't think Scotty or Brian are here tonight. Unless I'm not seeing them. Okay. So. I've been working, or we've been together working our way through this little book called Awakening Presence. It is a collection of uh, transcriptions, really, of talks given by some of the bhikkhunis, um, some of the uh, some of the monastics, the women monastics in uh, the West here in the United States, often but not only. Um, and we're almost complete with this book. So I think we're, we'll take uh, one more week after tonight. There's one talk by Aya Mindanandi to end the section. Oh, actually two more, sorry about that. So a few more weeks here uh, before we end. And I thought right after we were finished with, with the talks, then I would um, share some, share a little bit more about uh, the monastic community and what it's like, especially for women um, to live as monastics in, especially in the United States. And so I've been starting by reading the bios of the, of, um, the person whose words were looking at reading and studying. So this is, this is Ajahn Jitendriya. 
So Ajahn um, is a term of respect. It means teacher, generally. So you'll hear Ajahn or Aya, which are similar terms in this Buddhist lineage. So Ajahn Jitendriya was born in Sydney, Australia in 1963. While studying art at college, he was drawn more deeply to spiritual questions through investigating the nature of perception and consciousness. She graduated with a diploma in visual fine arts and later traveled through Southeast Asia, India, and Europe. While living in England in 1987, she became seriously interested in meditation and the teachings of the Buddha. Feeling a strong connection with the community at Amaravati Buddhist Monastery in England, and the teachings of Ajahn Chah and Ajahn Sumedho, she, she asked to live and practice in the way of the monastic Sangha there. Sangha means community. So she ordained in 1988, and then over the years has lived and trained in various communities, spending time in England, Australia, and the, and the United States. One of the things I love about this little book and, and often um, the teachings of the monastic community, especially the nuns actually is, um, my mind relates to their, their way quite easily. Um, they have, and especially Ajahn Jitendriya has a, a sort of integrated style that I really appreciate that I think helps us, certainly helps me uh, relate to my full life and be willing to bring my full self to the table really for my practice, right? Which is what we're all invited to do. We can sometimes um, simplify practice like and create these ways of putting practice in a particular place. Rather, the Dharma is an expansive orientation so, you know, one example is sometimes we'll see practice as something that we do on the cushion only, right? Or once a week when we come to common ground, well, that'll be our practice. But to expand that, to consider that every moment, every waking moment really is an opportunity to understand something. And at the core, we're, we're learning how to be in relationship right? with our own minds, our hearts, our personalities, our habits, and each other. We're learning how to relate to other beings in the same way. When we can take this broad, a broader scope to our practice, then we can start to feel like the whole world is an ally in our learning, right? And each other's learning. Like we're, we are a support to each other to wake up, to learn, to understand, to feel more deeply to understand something about this interconnected reality that we're living in. And so in this, in this um, talk that Ajahn gives, she is talking about the heart of the Buddhist teachings, which is suffering. Right? The Buddha, Sometimes it's said that the Buddha said that he taught one thing and one thing only, that's suffering and the end of suffering, which might sound like, sound like two things, but, you know, one thing leads to the other, right? An understanding of suffering, then we can understand something about the release of suffering. When we understand something about clinging, we necessarily get interested in what it's like not to cling, right? Just like when we get interested in being in relationship of being in wise relationship with life, with all life, with the earth, with each other, with our own hearts and our own experience, then we, we also learn. Sometimes we see the shadow of that, what it's like when we're not in wise relationship. Right? And, and so in a way of being in relationship, of understanding suffering, of understanding what it's like when we fall out of relationship, we might call that suffering. Suffering is when we, um, these moments when we say no to life or we reject something that's already here. Being in relationship with life is a way of not, not liking everything that we see or not feeling 
bliss or peace or happiness at every turn, but actually saying yes to the experience that's here so that we can, we can learn something about how to continue, how to keep moving, how to keep participating, how to keep engaging. Right? Because we, all of us, we could probably all say that we have various reasons for coming to this practice, but we can also probably all agree that at the core of our reasons might be not wanting to have, not wanting to collapse, not wanting life to do us in, being willing to stand up in the middle of everything that's important to us, in the middle of our civic responsibilities, in the middle of our family life, in the middle of our work, in the middle of our friendships, Right? We don't want to have to throw somebody or something out of our heart or somehow get a, escape our predicament in order to be okay. We want to learn how to be okay wherever we're at. We want to learn how to be okay in the middle of sickness, in the middle of great illness, in the middle of a pandemic. Right? It doesn't mean that we have to like every moment or be happy in every moment, but we wanna be able to compassionately engage the current conditions of our lives. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I don't know, <laughs> not if it does. <laughs> okay, go like this if, if you're not with me. Okay, I'll assume that you're there. <laughs> And, and so Ajahn, and as she describes what it's like to, to suffer and to find our, to suffer and to not suffer, you know, this is what we do as human beings. We find ourselves in predicaments where we don't, you know, we know like, oh, you know, this is not going the way I wanted it to. And I'm really tied up in knots about the situation. I don't think this is the way forward. And then we have these moments when we're like, oh, I'm, I'm really here and I'm really present. And I really care. And even though there's pain, this feels like a more sustainable way forward. Have you had moments like that when you've been ang super angry or really anxious or just really resisting some change or transition, you know, in moments like this and you're, and we know like, you know, this isn't really helping. It's not really benefiting the situation that I'm in. And then we start seeking another way. And sometimes we find our middle, ourselves in the middle of a very difficult conversation with a loved one. And although there's a lot of pain moving in the heart, it feels like, God, I'm so surprised at how present I can be in the middle of this. You know, so this is the play here between suffering and the end of suffering. This is what the Buddha is pointing to, that it's possible to be in the middle of difficulty, to be in the middle of, you know, whatever the conditions are in our lives and be able to be there. It might not feel good, but we learn, our, we learn how our, our capacity develops. We watch that happen with practice. And so Ajahn is talking about, you know, how finding our way finding our way to that sweet spot, if you will, where we're in our lives, we're feeling, we're learning, we're growing. It's not always easy, but we're doing it. It's like falling off of this side and then getting ourselves back on in the middle and then falling off in the other direction and getting ourselves back in the middle, right? We can think about so many, effort is a great example in this way. We can, you know, decide that we, want to be we want to take up this path of practice and so we come and we real serious right and we sit still and we practice every day and we don't let ourselves move for 45 minutes and and then we you know burn out right because something is off we're we're a little bit too much effortful right and then we can fall off in the other direction we come to practice and we think this is real groovy and we just lie down on our bed every time we 
try to meditate and we go to sleep. Well, that's a little bit too loose, right? And, but we don't know what's too loose or too tight until we try and kind of fall off one direction or fall off the other, right? So finding the middle way is about like doing this kind of teeter-totter thing like, oh, not okay, that's a little bit too much. Or maybe, you know, let me see about that. And teachers, communities are really good ways of helping ourselves write ourselves back to the middle, right? This is what she says about finding the middle. We know when we find the middle, there's a resting, a clarity. There's an understanding on a very intuitive level and we can just be with things the way they are. Then the tension and conflict eases out, unravels, dissipates. The more we find that way of being, it's not a static position. It's a living, responsive, sensitive way of being. The more we begin to recognize it intuitively and something in us learns and grows in confidence with the experience of that. It's not a static position. It's a living, responsive, sensitive way of being. This is the learning process. It's, it's a relationship, right? Relationships are really dynamic. They're intimate, they're dynamic. They're always evolving. They're ne never the same. This is what it's like to live and practice, to live and practice the Dhamma, to live and practice being a wise and compassionate human being. This is what we mean by practicing meditation or practicing the Dharma. We're learning how to be wise and skillful and compassionate and more and more, more and more often in our lives. One of the, the traps that we can sometimes find is in spiritual practice or becoming meditators, we, you know, and, and it's actually fine to aspire to be more stable, for example. Sometimes we say calm, but more stable, I like that a little bit better because calm is sometimes a uh, inaccessible place for this heart mind in some moments. And, and we have this, uh, we can sometimes put this extra thing on calm, like it's a very still, deep, and mm, a place where nothing, nothing can hurt us. But stable is a slightly different for me. Stable brings back, brings forward a little bit more of that energy that I was speaking of a few minutes ago, where we are right here, where we have, where there's presence, where we're connected, where we're feeling, where we're, we're actually in relationship. So in these moments when we are feeling stable, then, then we, we learn how to be wise. We learn how to be skillful. Right? We learn how to be compassionate. And what I was gonna say is that sometimes with practice, we tend to, to think that it's some sort of transcendent place. Like if we're practicing well enough, then nothing's going to hurt us or nothing's going to touch us. We're just going to reside in states of calm, happiness, bliss, right? Where most things are pleasant in our lives. But in reality, what we learn is that we, it's not like that at all. There are some moments like that, but there are also plenty of other moments where things aren't pleasant or where we're reckoning with real deep dilemmas, right? And this is actually, this actually feels um, like the fruit of deep practice. When we grow in our competency to meet life on life's terms, right? Where we grow in our, in, you know, our capacity to be good partners or good friends or good coworkers, where we wrestle or uh, maybe reckon better, reckon with the tension in relationship. Learning how to be in relationship is, is always involves tension, always involves some conflict. 
So we don't want to somehow hold this view that practicing well, meditating well, or being a good mindfulness student of mindfulness is about eliminating that tension. It's actually the opposite. It's moving right into the tension, appreciating the tension, because that's where we learn how to grow more confident. That's where we learn how to be more stable. It's where we learn just what we're, what we're capable of, right? That we're capable of staying engaged, staying in relationship during really difficult moments. Ajahn makes a point to, to remind us that um, one of the one of the traps, you know, this movement that sometimes the uh, unwise view that practice is about bliss and happiness and pleasant experience all the time. also includes expecting that our, our wounds, our psychological wounds, our traumas, our personality habits, you know, will, will magically disappear when we start to take up something like mindfulness practice. But just like stability means becoming more competent and not necessarily um, always calm, practicing wisely, practicing in relationship, in wise relationship with our own hearts includes connecting in ways that we never have before with the depth of our experience. And it's often that we, we start to really feel like, wow, I didn't know how far reaching these patterns of anxiety reach. I didn't know how far back they go. I didn't know how ingrained these habits of blame are in this heart, or I didn't know how entrenched it is that this heart just wants to run away from any conflict. Sometimes this is what we reckon with, always actually. We're always gonna meet up with our psychological conditioning when we start to practice. So it's not a sign of bad practice if this is the territory that we're in. If when we sit, we start to feel this stuff like, oh, I just feel my personality habits all the time. That's good news. It's great practice. We can learn how to appreciate these habits just like we would any other deep experience. Okay. Oh, we can learn that these habits have their own trajectory we don't actually own them. They've been around for as long as they've been around. Sometimes we can track them back to childhood and they have a life and momentum of their own, right? So I sometimes will play with this with anxiety, which has been around for me for quite some time, for as long as I can remember, way back my earliest childhood memories. And so instead of want being goal oriented, wanting anxiety to go away, for example, you know, which would be living in that place of expecting meditation to make me calm and happy and blissful all the time, right? If I was a good practitioner that I wouldn't be anxious, something like that. But instead of that, holding a different attitude, the attitude that this is my teacher and this moment of tension with anxiety is where I learn and grow to be bigger than I think I can be. It's where I learn how to be more competent. It's where I learn how to keep walking, how to keep doing my life, how to keep being in relationship with people, how I learn how to talk when my voice quivers, right with anxiety. It's where I learn that anxiety doesn't have to do me in, right? That I can stand up, I don't have to collapse in the face of anxiety. And anxiety is just an example for me, but we each have our own thing. And this is one of the points that Ajahn is making that, that when we get in touch with our own 
experiences when we allow everything to move, when we don't have any no's about what shows up, right? doesn't matter. All of our woundedness, all of our personality habits, all of our identities and the way we relate to them, when we allow all of this to show up, when we allow all of this to blossom, then we, we become more real. We actually become real. And there exists in this realness, the possibility of learning, of learning everything that we need to learn. And she kind of goes on to talk about, you know, the, the systems, um, ways of protecting itself from vulnerability, like our nervous system, our constitution, our mind, our hearts. I'll use all of these words and phrases interchangeably. But there's a kind of vulnerability that exists for us when we, be, when we practice mindfulness. when we see the shadows of our personality habits, right? When we feel into what's moving in our hearts in deep and meaningful ways. And so, and so these habits that exist for us are ways of protecting that vulnerability. We sit down and we start to feel and it's hard to feel and we practice acceptance and then realize like, oh, this heart is really tied up in knots right now. Restless, oh, I don't like that, I feel that, I feel not liking it. Oh, feeling bad about not liking it. Oh, that's interesting, right? Can care about that, not liking it. Oh, look at that, now the heart feels tender and vulnerable, now I'm sensitive, now I could easily be hurt by someone else. And then another kind of, you know, protective habit might come, shut that off, disconnect, don't feel that. You know, this is just kind of the way practice goes. And she's really normalizing this for us, that, in, that all of the protective habits are protecting the system from vulnerability. And we're doing something counter to that. We're we're practicing, we're leaning into the vulnerability. She says, our need for security is so strong that our tendency to want to find a position, to find who we are, to identify with this thing or that thing, this is a major force in the mind. That searching force is always looking to be something, get out of this sense of insecurity. We have to get familiar with that very uncomfortable place of not quite being anything at all, of not quite knowing what's going on even. It feels very uncomfortable, but actually it's a very potent place to practice. This is the tension I was talking about right here. She says, you can see the mind in all its desperation searching for security or affirmation or approval, needing something concrete, something firm, something to identify with. That's just the force of this kind of craving. It's there and it's what we have to learn from to see how it's always leading us into new births, new positions, new views of ourselves and others in the world. We can see these positions and views taking shape, forming, and we can also see them breaking up and dissolving. I thought that was so beautiful how she connects this, this path of vulnerability to this system's need for security and, and how our, our minds will, will look for it anywhere. So when we feel this back and forth, right, where we're falling off this way and then falling off that way and getting back to the middle and then falling off again, this is, this is, the, this is how it is. This is how we, we train in being more intimate, more vulnerable. And this connection with being able to do it here on the cushion 
when we take time out of our lives for this kind of meditation, this solitary meditation practice, then and then we also leave the cushion and we re-engage with other humans. So we get practice at both ends, right? If we're only able to be vulnerable on the cushion, it doesn't really do us any good in our lives, right? And if we're only practicing when we're talking, then we don't benefit fully from the kind of exposure that comes with quiet time where we're just going inward. So we need to, we need to be doing both, even if, if it's for a few minutes at a time, right? So to illust illustrate some of this, so I was um, out at Common Grounds Retreat Property in uh, Prairie Farm, Wisconsin for an open house last weekend. And it was a nice day. We had invited, if some of you have been out there, I know it's a small, it was a small single family home and farm country in Wisconsin, about an hour and 15 minutes from Common Grounds City Center in South Minneapolis. And over the past several years, we've been renovating it into a, a retreat center. So now there's nine bedrooms and um, a tiny house and uh, people can go out there for, small groups can go out there for practice. And it's a new community, right? So a lot of the time that we've owned the property, which I'm not even sure about saying that, owning anymore. But since we've been stewards of that property and the land, um, since it's been our responsibility, it's been under renovation. So we haven't really gotten to know our neighbors that well. So this open house was a chance to invite some of the neighbors to just see what it's all about. We're not that weird, really ordinary people, eating lasagna, drinking root beer, you know, sitting around the fire talking about life and regular things. And there was a, a moment we were walking, it was a handful, of, uh, probably about 25 people or so, which is really sweet. And it said in rural, you know, in this particular part of the of the world, there are a lot of farmers and some uh, conservative views, right? I know that because I've seen a number of Trump signs in yards over the years. And so, um, so this is an interesting place to practice, right? So, okay, so we're taking a little tour and at some point a person from the neighborhood comes up to me and she's like real close to me and, you know, you hear a lot of weird things like everything is offered on generosity. We don't charge for anything. So that's a weird thing. That's not usually how things work, right? So she starts with that, like asks me, well, what does that mean? <laughs> and I explained, you know, this is the way Common Ground operates. Everything's free of charge. You can contribute. You know, we all participate in this way. When we come to programs, we're giving something, we're receiving something. It's not just money, it's not a transactional thing. We're always in relationship, let's say something like this. And she's like, okay, well, she just like looks at me with this very long stare. And then she moves on to an, another question, right? And then, you know, five minutes later, she comes back to that. Well, how much do things really cost? <laughs> you know, like just not quite, it doesn't, it's just not the way we live. It's very different. And so there were several of these moments not just about Donna, but where she was asking me, like, can I come here? Is it okay? Can you, you keep saying that it's free of charge, but that, does that include me? Or you keep saying that everybody, anybody can come here, but does that include me? You know, in these various ways, you don't really know me. Do you really mean that? Right? And so this was like a 10 minute conversation, but it really struck me that she was trying to get me, she was trying to understand. And the more we talked, the more I engaged with the conversation, the more wholehearted I felt about saying, yes, you get to practice here too. You know, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. If we say this place is open to anybody, that means you. 
and I have to, I have to own that. I have to really be in that, be in, be in the reality of that. And, and so this is interesting, right? Because I have my own political views. I have my own spiritual practice and it's different from many people. I'm not the, you know, there's lots of views out there. There's lots of ways to live. And if, if we talked, if we got into an, a discussion, we might have very different views, like me and this person, right? We, I could probably get real into the territory of differing political views, maybe different religious views. But there was no doubt in my mind there was no doubt. It was very interesting to be a practitioner having this conversation because there was no, there was no doubt that I loved her, right? that I cared about her practice, her life, her experience deepening into learning how to be stable in the face of anything, not collapse, learning how to be wise and skillful as much as I cared about my own. Now that doesn't mean to say, I'm not like not naive that if we spent a month together at Prairie Farm and started talking a lot that we might find ourselves into messy exchanges where our views collided. But it was, it's a very interesting place to live as a practitioner to be able to not cling to one's views, not to own them, not to think they are mine but to find a way to experience love for another human being, right? I was um, experiencing something a little bit different uh, a couple days before this, where I was listening to one of my, uh, a politician that I respect. And I have found myself, there's a lot of interesting political things going on in Minneapolis, Minnesota um, right now. Uh, and I know that some of you are probably tracking even though you're not here. And I'm, I'm not, you know, the, the politics behind it is not that important. What's interesting is that I was listening to somebody who I was aligned with, or I thought I was aligned with. Right? I thought my views were right because, and their views are right. But when I started to hear, when I listened to them talk, I realized like, oh, my views are not aligned with those views. And what happened in my mind in that moment was doubt. Shelly, you are wrong. <laughs> you might be wrong about your views. You better adopt those views, right? And then you'll be on the, on the right side of this. And that was a really interesting moment to be a practitioner also because the mind was really seeking for some resolution of the tension, right? How can two people, how can two really respectable people, kind, compassionate, spiritual people, one a politician, one just an ordinary Shelley, how can two people have such radically different views and still come from a place of love, right? The mind didn't really wanna live in that tension wanted to just make it easy and adopt another view, like as if that will do the trick, right? To kind of avoid the tension of how do I reckon with this different differing view? How do I reckon with this reality that humans have different views? How do I reckon with the reality of not clinging to one's views? That's much harder, right? It's much harder to not cling to my views. It's much harder to not throw someone out of my heart when we have different views. So the mind wanted to just quickly jump over that, that difficulty and just go straight to the resolution. I know how to re resolve this dilemma. I know how to not do that hard work. I know, just adopt another view, right? Figure that piece out. And so this is, it's not just, um, what we do here as practitioners, it's not just, it's really far reaching, right? 
when we um when we really live into practicing fully in our lives under every circumstance that we're living in, not somehow thinking that practice, you know, if I would have had a view that practice was only what I did that morning for 30 minutes, I would have missed the opportunity to practice with the person at Prairie Farm. I would have missed the opportunity to practice right here in this moment when I was listening to a, a politician who was also a deeply respected person in my mind, right? I would have missed the opportunity to reckon right here and learn how to come into wiser relationship with other humans and with the views in my own mind. And so just some encouragement to really expand the parameters that we see ourselves in as spiritual beings, as mindfulness practitioners, as meditators, because we can learn all that we need to learn through the course of our lives. It's kind of a long passage, but I loved it, Ajahn Jitendriya. As we continue the practice, there are always more challenges, however. There is always more to learn. It seems to me that practice results in a gradual breaking down of the various views we accumulate. Once something works for us in our practice, we often end up creating some kind of view about it. It's another attempt of the deluded mind to establish some kind of security or foothold. Sooner or later, we are going to meet the limitations of that view. It will all fall apart. And we're going to find ourselves again in unknown territory, meeting the unknown. Part of that process, at least in my experience, is that in coming to the edge of those views, it often feels like coming to the edge of myself. And having those views fall apart often feels like myself falling apart or experiencing the sense of dying. When you meet the limitations of who you thought you were, when you meet the fears of your own failure created from your own expectations of yourself, when you just can't meet that image of what you're supposed to be, then what happens there is very powerful. In my own practice, this has been the point of the most incredible kind of pain actually, and the kind of effort it takes to stay with that process and the learning and letting go that can happen there is very powerful. What you need there is the heart capacity just to be with the unknown, to be with the painful, the capacity to acknowledge the depth of your own hatred and fear of pain, to hold the strength of your own rebellion and resistance. You need the capacity to be fully present compassionately with all of that. Thanks for your kind and patient attention tonight, friends. <laughs> 